Currently, in some circles, there is a revival of interest in Xenophon, a long ignored and quite worthy contemporary of Plato and student of Socrates. His Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus, is apparently an account of the rise to power of a historical figure, Cyrus the Great. But the account is highly fictionalized, leaving the reader free to speculate about Xenophon's intent. I will try to give you enough textual references to make my speculations intelligible to those of you who haven't read the book. The handout should help. The handout has six block quotes. Um, there are a lot of other smaller quotes throughout this. I will, uh, they're not numbered on there, but um, I'll just tell you this is the first, second. Okay, lectures entitled Xenophon's Cyropedia, The Limits of Political Excellence. This seems like right in my face. That's better. Cyrus, Xenophon tells us in the first chapter of the education of Cyrus, knew how to rule humans. Xenophon contrasts recalcitrant humans with more pliable cattle and horses. Human beings are animals notoriously difficult to govern, he says. Despite a variety of threats, some from other sources, some from human enemies, quote, human beings unite against none more than against those they, whom they perceive attempting to rule them. But Cyrus, first block quote, was able to extend fear of himself to so much of the world that he intimidated all, and no one attempted anything against him. He was able to implant so great a desire of gratifying him that they always thought it proper to be governed by his judgment. How do the two accomplishments Xenophon here ascribes to Cyrus go together? Must intimidation precede the acceptance of his judgment? The desire to gratify Cyrus may arise from intimidation or from something else. His subjects may find it appropriate to submit to his judgment because his judgment is good, merely because resistance is dangerous, or both. If the reader accepts that they literally always thought it proper to submit to his judgment, fear must play a part in their deference to Cyrus, for it would be wondrous indeed if all subjects judged for themselves and found that their judgment consistent, consistently concurred with Cyrus's. The difficulties that arise when humans resist rule are so great, and most humans are irrational so that it is necessary and even appropriate to make some use of fear. But Xenophon does not claim that Cyrus's knowledge of how to rule makes him simply good. He finds Cyrus worthy of wonder. While Cyrus's rule may provide a model for other rulers to imitate, Xenophon does not honor him unreservedly. Near the end of the Seripedia, after Cyrus's campaign against Egypt, Xenophon describes his domain, second block quote. At this point, the Indian Ocean bounded his empire to the east, the Black Sea to the north, Cyprus and Egypt to the west, and Ethiopia to the south. The limits of these borders are uninhabitable because of heat in one case, by cold in another, by water in another, and by lack of water in another." End quote. Cyrus evidently rules all the known inhabitable world. His conquests, it supposedly includes humans of all the different nations. The Greeks are left out for some reason. Xenophon describes the attitude of Cyrus's subjects toward him this way. Third block quote. Human beings were so disposed to him that every nation thought they got less if they did not send to Cyrus whatever fine thing either grew naturally in their land, was raised there, or was made by art. And so too every city. Um, and every private person thought that he would become wealthy if he could gratify Cyrus in something. For Cyrus, taking from whatever the givers had in abundance, gave in return what he perceived to be lacking." End quote. Cyrus attends to the needs of his subjects to an extraordinary degree. While he gives only what he perceives to be lacking, by doing so he inspires both trust and gratitude in the receiving subjects. The achievement seems impossible for any ruler to surpass. But although Cyrus both acquires and maintains his rule successfully, not all his subjects are equally grateful or content. 
When he enters Babylon, his last major conquest, Cyrus himself acknowledges that his most recently acquired subjects serve him unwillingly. In fact, Xenophon says, Cyrus, quote, kept his own problem in mind, that he was preparing to dwell in the biggest of all cities in evidence, and that it was as hostile to him as a city could be to any man, end quote. Cyrus quickly acquires a troop of bodyguards whom he evidently castrates to make sure they are loyal to him alone. He relies on the example of neutered animals to assure him himself that they lose none of their usefulness as a result. There is no evidence that the Babylonians receive from Cyrus what they lack or need, or that they generously give of what is abundant among them. Even if the Babylonians in general lack understanding of their own good and need Cyrus's instruction, it is both offensive and unreasonable to assert that his bodyguard lived better than they would have had they been left whole. Like the condition of the bodyguard, the subjection of the city of Babylon is imposed upon its people by conquest and maintained by necessity. Cyrus makes use of the populace to spy on each other, isolates himself from the masses, dresses in imposing robes, and uses other extraordinary means to appear godlike when he does emerge from his palace. Clearly, he does not count on the Babylonians evaluating his judgments and determining them to be proper and good. Perhaps Cyrus's Babylonian subjects are outliers, even more resistant to rule than other humans. Does Cyrus secure their good, whether they know it or not? For humans often delude themselves, or, by contrast, are they, and perhaps all his subjects, made incomplete, like his bodyguards, to serve him more devotedly? Cyrus's conquest of Croesus, which precedes his attack on Babylon, raises a different but related question. Must any virtuous subject of Cyrus conceal and dissemble to preserve himself? The examples of the eunuchs and of Croesus lead one to wonder whether even Cyrus's willing subjects rescind or are robbed of the distinctive human possibility of self-rule. Does Cyrus rule them by reducing them to obedient animals, or whatever their delusions, does he see them precisely as they are? I will proceed to explore the character of Cyrus's rule. My account is divided into four sections. One, the education of Cyrus, his virtue, and Xenophon's project. This is my most favorable treatment of Cyrus. Suggesting that Cyrus's methods of ruling are rooted in his early experience, Xenophon reports in detail on his early education. Even as a child, Cyrus is devoted to the pursuit of honor. Nothing but the highest honors satisfy him so he strives to deserve them. From early childhood, he shows himself to be the best at every endeavor his teachers require of him and at others he finds worth pursuing. His superior accomplishments win him constant praise. His earlier, early education in Persia teaches him to submit willingly to physical demands, to tolerate want and discomfort for the sake of distinguishing himself. In Media, when he visits his grandfather Astyages, he is 12 when he comes to visit, he strive to, strives to excel all others at horsemanship. He repudiates any special consideration he might receive in competitions as the grandson of the king. Among the Medes, he distinguishes himself just as he has already as a child in Persia, and despite the nation's different norms of behavior, is able to return to his childhood home as a young man and resume his place as the first among his peers. His excellences are the result of his innate high spirit and talents, along with his intense drive to win merit, however difficult the task. He combines Persian self-discipline and median awareness of rank. In Persia, the elders choose magistrates and adjudicate disputes. According to Mandani, Cyrus's mother, the king, his father, quote, is the first to do what has been ordered by the city and to accept what has been ordered. Not his soul, but the law is the measure, end quote. She contrasts Persian rule with the median rule of her father, Astyages, who rules alone and acknowledges no one as fit to compete with him. 
Mandane worries that if her son remains in Media, he will substitute the despotic ways of her father for the justice of Persia. Cyrus's manner of ruling turns out to differ from both. Still a child, <coughs> in Media, Cyrus recounts a story to his mother to allay her fears. He tells her that in Persia, when he was even younger, he learned what justice is. The occasion was the one time he suffered punishment as a violation of justice. He approved a large boy's action when that boy took away a larger tunic from a small boy and exchanged it for his own small one. Cyrus's teacher beat him for substituting the fitting for the just. The small boy would have been better off with the smaller tunic and vice versa, but justice demanded that their, own, their ownership of the less fitting tunics be upheld. As a child then, Cyrus learned that justice depends upon law, in particular the laws that determine property. And what the, that laws are established by the prevailing regime. Nowhere, apparently, can one assume that justice and the fitting coincide. At the end of book one, Cyrus's grandfather Astyages is dead. Cyrus is on his way to Media with an army because his uncle Cyaxares has called upon Cyrus to lead the Persians to defend Media against its Assyrian enemies. Cyrus has impressed and manipulated many before, but this begins his first formal position of command over others. The Assyrians have already conquered many surrounding nations and seem to be plotting to go after Media next and perhaps Persia too. Cyrus accepts the role as commander and exhorts his men saying, quote, what is more just than defending ourselves or more noble than aiding friends, end quote. In war making, he combines the noble and the just. War provides Cyrus with the opportunity to suspend the laws that govern Persians at home. Once he is in command of the army, his dictates are binding on all his followers. No army in wartime could be ruled by many, but for Cyrus, the distinction between peace and war turns out to be a distinction between being ruled and ruling. Rulers must constantly be prepared for war. The acquisition of subjects never ends. Cyrus's teacher acknowledged that the young Cyrus judged well of the fitting. His rule over his soldiers suggests that he judges well how best to use men, what they are most fit for. They are fit for little if they are less than perfectly obedient and loyal. Before Cyrus leaves Persia to defend Media, his father Cambyses points out to him that people are ruled willingly when they believe their ruler is more prudent in pursuit of their own good than they are themselves. The best way to appear prudent, he says, is to be so. To begin with, the army must obey Cyrus willingly. Unlike his uncle Cyaxares, who lacks the ability to defend his nation with his own people, Cyrus earns his army's trust. He does not simply command their obedience. He holds himself to an even stricter standard than the one they must fulfill. His self-discipline and his judgment demonstrate that he is fit to rule over them. As a military commander, Cyrus becomes an educator of others in a way that reflects his early education, but there are differences. His first followers are Persians some of whom have undergone the same education he has while in Persia, a long process open only to those boys whose family are wealthy enough that they are not needed at home. They form the aristocracy, the class called the peers. Once in media with his army, Cyrus invites Persians too poor to have been educated like him to fight with the same weapons and to compete directly with the peers for honor. They have acquired similar virtues without formal schooling, but they owe their elevation to the level of peers to Cyrus alone. He expands his army to include men of other nationalities as well. All must train themselves and strive to cultivate the same virtues. Cyrus universalizes the military training that makes up much of Persian education while abandoning the political structure and the laws that distinguish his childhood home. As Cyrus and his army conquer nation after nation, those who are not capable of governing themselves defer to him on those grounds. 
when Cyaxares resists Cyrus's growing ascendancy over him among the Medians, his resistance is pathetic, for he shows no ability to restrain his desire for sensual pleasures, and few, if any, trust that he will do for them what is best. Cyrus pities and indulges him, and finally he allows Cyrus free reign. It is Cyrus's demonstration of his fitness to govern that permits him to take over as the de facto commander of the Median army. His word becomes their law. The erotic attraction of a Median follower called Artabazus feels for Cyrus, inspires him to exhort other Median soldiers to join with Cyrus. Artabazus never gets much of Cyrus's attention. No private attachments, attachments compromise his government over all. The Armenians and Chaldeans fit Xenophon's description of complacent followers. Cyrus pursues the Armenians because they have refused to pay tribute to the Medians according to an earlier treaty, and Cyrus needs funds for the army. After Cyrus unites them with their enemies, the Chaldeans, and modifies both nations' governments and their ways of life, their leaders seem satisfied that they're better off than they've ever been before. They are in a way like his uncle, when the Armenian king refused to pay tribute to Media, he was drawn to the nobility of li living independently, but he was engaging in a fantasy that he could not make real. Submission in his case results from recognition of two simple facts. He is not capable of governing an independent people, and his people are too soft to defend themselves. In the end, they will mix with the more warlike but impoverished mountain people, the Chaldeans, and both will prosper. Cyrus becomes their indirect governor. They will govern themselves in accord with his plan. They will share land and intermarry, and neither will determine what constitutes a threat to their people, for Cyrus has taken that responsibility upon himself. He, in turn, will use them for his own ends. In these cases, men who seem incapable of ruling themselves effectively give way to Cyrus, who is competent to rule them all for his and their good alike the just and the fitting seem to have been combined. The son of the Armenian king, Tigranes, apparently persuades Cyrus not to kill the king and to allow him to maintain his position while emptying it of authority. Before Tigranes speaks, Cyrus must, has probably decided to be merciful, but he permits Tigranes to make his arguments and Cyrus appears to be moved. It is advantageous to Cyrus to win the gratitude of the Armenians in general and to revive the friendship of Tigranes, with whom he was close when he visited Media as a child. Tigranes argues that the fear his father has experienced will make him moderate and thus useful to Cyrus. But while Tigranes defends his father and his people from destruction, he also abandons them in favor of friendship with Cyrus. He has reason to abandon his father he executed a distinguished friend of Tigranes, a man Tigranes describes as noble and good. This friend seems to have been a philosopher, a Socratic figure who asserted that the wrongs humans commit in ignorance are involuntary. The king saw this man as a rival with him for his son's respect. Cyrus treats Tigranes' father's unjust treatment of his son's teacher sympathetically. It was a human error, he says. It is natural for humans to envy those who attain honor greater than theirs. Through this speech, and as a result of the death of the philosopher, Cyrus manages to absorb even the one independently thoughtful indiv individual he encounters under his dominion. Cyrus demands no more of his subjects than what they are capable of, and he apparently renders them satisfied with their accomplishments, however meager. As for Tigranes, he distinguishes himself from his weak Armenian compatriots, but he gladly follows Cyrus, bringing along his wife, whom he loves. Tigranes subordinates everything to the demands of Cyrus's project, which turns out to include not just the protection of media, but the domination of Asia itself. Many, perhaps most, of Cyrus's newly acquired subjects lack sufficient freedom to distinguish themselves nobly. Their goodness is simply obedience. Unless they display a strong desire to fight for Cyrus against his enemies, Cyrus deprives conquered peoples of arms and thus of the ability to defend themselves. 
The prohibition of arms to whole populations secures Cyrus in his position as ruler and legislator in those nations he subdues, but knows he cannot trust. If things go well, most subjects enjoy economic prosperity and its attendant sensual pleasures. If Xenophon's history of Cyrus is an indication of human behavior in general, even humans who try to insist on governing themselves generally submit to such gently despotic government. The changes Cyrus imposes on his subjects impact not only their military experience, but every aspect of their lives, the relations between men and women, the structure of the family, their desires and hopes. To the extent that subjects adapt to the new ways of life, even the orders of their, order of their souls must change. If they live better than they had before, these changes are beneficial. But what makes for a good way of life? Does Cyrus know better than his subjects how they might live best? The education of Cyrus Xenophon refers to in the title of his work is not only the education that shapes Cyrus from childhood to youth, it is also the education of his followers. The two are different. To the extent that ruling is educating, it is persuasive. The ruled accept Cyrus as the most fit to rule. His laws appear to them just. Cyrus's education of his willing followers is evidently an improvement over Persian rule, which left the just and the fitting at odds. Section two, Croesus, the limits to Cyrus's ability to educate. The subjection of the Armenians and Chaldeans occurs when Cyrus is merely preparing for the war for which he left home. He was sent from Persia to engage the Assyrians who threatened Media and would have subdued Cyrus's uncle, Cyaxares. Lacking sufficient men and resources at first, Cyrus amasses both before he approaches Assyria. The Assyrians respond to the increased threat Cyrus poses by submitting to Croesus, the king of Lydia, and a man they consider capable of leading them to victory. If Croesus had defeated Cyrus, Cyrus would have been forced to acknowledge that his authority had bounds. Asia would not be entirely subject to Persian rule, but that doesn't happen. Cyrus puts everything he has into the fight, and as always, he prevails. His means include fraud, as his father Cyaxares told him they must to get an advantage over his enemies. I'm quoting, be assured, he said, that the one who is going to do this must be a plotter, a dissembler, wily, a cheat, a thief, rapacious, and the sort who takes advantage of his enemies in everything, end quote. Shortly before the battle between Cyrus's forces and Croesus's, Cyrus employs a spy, who convinces Croesus to permit him to help organize the Assyrian troops. Cyrus's instructions were for the spy to reorder the troops to confuse and undermine them just before they go into battle. While Cyrus seems to make none, Croesus makes a crucial mistake. He puts his trust in this spy. Cyrus's men are experienced in fighting together and trust their leader to secure the conditions under which they appear noblest and best. He has even acquired a noble and daring Assyrian fighter called Abradatus, the king of Susa, who is convinced he owes Cyrus his life for protecting his wife from the aggression of Araspus, the same man who acts as Cyrus's spy. Abradatus believes not only that this man threatened to rape his beautiful wife, Panthea, but that he is a traitor to Cyrus. As it happens, Araspus's reputation as a traitor is merely a cover for espionage. Cyrus has used Araspus' erotic excesses as an occasion to send him into the enemy's midst to show his worth. In the battle that takes place, Cyrus loses both Abradatus and many others who distinguish themselves. Indeed, at one point in the battle, Cyrus himself is in grave danger of losing his life. The Egyptians, not the Lydians, whom Croesus rules directly, especially distinguish themselves. During the battle, it is for a time unclear whether Cyrus will prevail against the multinational army Croesus leads. Just after Croesus's defeat, Cyrus and he have a conversation which apparently provides justification for the nearly universal dominance that Cyrus is on his way to acquire. 
Croesus, the ruler of the Alliance and King of Lydia, yields to him, and he claims to do so voluntarily. Croesus begins by confessing to Cyrus that he was too little trusting of the gods. He tested them and so annoyed them. This is not Herodotus' Cyrus exactly, but there are some similarities. He seems to think he could have won victory through the gods' support if he had prayed differently. In fact, unlike Cyrus, he was probably too trusting of other humans. Araspus is the prime example, but Croesus also trusted his flatterers. If he truly thinks that he who wins possesses the right nature and always has the support of gods, he is naive at best. But as Croesus proceeds in his speech, he sounds much cleverer and less naive. Croesus had secured the willing obedience of the Assyrians and other, and other kings and thought he had the virtue to lead them and their men to enable them to compete successfully against Cyrus's well-trained soldiers. Croesus put it, puts it like this, quote, I undertook the generalship as if I were competent to become the greatest, end quote. Croesus confesses that he was flattered when others conceived of him as a noble leader, a rival to Cyrus. He did not know himself, he says, before his defeat. Now he truly has self-knowledge. He knows he lacks the competence to become the greatest and even to compete with Cyrus at all. As evidence, Croesus points to his own humble lineage and, and says that Cyrus was descended from the gods. He adds that Cyrus had been practicing virtue since childhood. Croesus declares himself justly punished for his mistake. Apollo's oracle once informed him that he would pass through life happily knowing himself. Now he claims in submission to Cyrus's demands and in possession of true self-knowledge, he will live blessedly happy as his wife has done hitherto. His wife has been sharing in good, refined, and delightful things with her husband, but has had nothing to do with war and battle. Croesus's wife presumably avoided war by custom and by choice. Cyrus forbids Croesus to engage in those things, and Croesus expresses gratitude as though he were being liberated. War is onerous, but if Croesus is being punished, as he claims, whether justly or otherwise, war, or at least the things one can acquire through war, had an attraction for him. Moreover, like the leaders of the Armenians and Chaldeans, he must witness his people lose their independence under Cyrus's domain. Croesus wished to be great, and now he must see his people rendered slavish. Now the power to make his life miserable or happy is in Cyrus's hands. Croesus cannot express the simple and straightforward truth when he speaks to Cyrus about his conquest. His submissive remarks to Cyrus are contrived. No doubt, for Croesus, the battle against Cyrus was painful. Defeat was, of course, even worse for he has lost his high hopes. He is humbled, if not humiliated. It is unlikely that Croesus is in fact looking forward to a superior, blessedly happy existence under the authority of Cyrus, but Croesus is no fool. He wants to preserve as much that is good in his life as he can. He tells Cyrus, whom he calls his new master, what would be least offensive and most satisfying. Although Croesus has indeed turned out not to be Cyrus's equal in war, he was quite capable of ruling himself and his fellow Lydians. Croesus speaks as though he is aware of none of this. He steals himself to speak and to act in the way most likely to serve his own reduced ends. He is so careful that Cyrus is, quote, amazed at his good spirits, end quote, after his defeat. Croesus' speech shows that he is prudent. Unlike that portion of Cyrus's subjects who submit with, with gratitude to his protection once their inability to fend for themselves has been demonstrated, Croesus trims his words to satisfy his conqueror. He does so because he wishes still to be happy. But what sort of happiness is available to him as a subject of the one ruler who will continue to fight for dominance over more and more of the known world? It would be absurd to argue that Croesus' defeat corrected the order of his soul so that he could live well according to his capabilities. Rather, it has presented him with facts he cannot change and must accept. 
When Croesus says he has come to recognize that gods too need to be shown gratitude, or they resent those inferior to, in power, and then goes on to suggest Cyrus is descended from the gods, he is acknowledging that the lesson he has learned is in fact a political lesson, not, or at least not primarily, a lesson in piety. Xenophon ends his report of the encounter between Cyrus and Croesus with the observation that Cyrus took the defeated Croesus wherever he went, quote, either because he believed that he was somehow useful or because he held it to be safer in this way, end quote. Cyrus is aware that Croesus is potentially dangerous. A man clever enough to be dangerous is so because he's capable of judging well in practical affairs. In other words, he may be useful to Cyrus only because he could have competed successfully with him. For such a man to exercise good practical judgment entirely for the benefit of another is not a source of happiness. It is no wonder if Cyrus does not trust that Croesus will consider him, himself blessedly happy, living like a woman, being protected by her manly husband. Cyrus and Croesus are alike in recognizing what they must do to achieve their ends. For them, self-knowledge and therefore self-governance are possible. Croesus, no doubt, modifies his self-assessment in response to his defeat by Cyrus. But Cyrus does not provide for him the standard of what will make him happy. One sign of this is Croesus' apparent attachment to his wife. Cyrus has no such attachment. When he finally marries, it is clear that he does so entirely for political ends. He must engender a successor to his rule. Cyrus cannot imagine how Croesus can tolerate life as a private man, but Croesus evidently understands Cyrus well. Every other good is only good insofar as it helps him achieve his ends. Most of his subjects accept their position of inferiority to Cyrus and submit to his authority. The best of them aspire to be like him. They accept his example as a model of virtue and happiness, and to the extent that they fall short of it, they agree, they must submit to the man himself. If they are to excel and win honor, they must serve him and win acknowledgement for their service. In doing so, they may share in his glory. Some of them achieve other ends as well, revenge against enemies, for example. None of them is free, however, to rule himself in accord with his own understanding of what is good. It may be that Croesus aspires to a good other than honor or domestic happiness. His ability, once defeated, to recognize the way things are for him and his people may indicate that he can find satisfaction in the clear-minded acceptance of the truth. At Cyrus's side continually, he is in a position to observe and reflect upon the affairs of more active men. This much is clear. In reconciling himself to the new state of affairs, he shows both good character and intelligence. Unlike Abradatus, the husband of Apanthea and an Assyrian, he is not Cyrus's slave. Abradatus is a stunning example of Asian submission. He is a warrior who would never have submitted to Cyrus except through Panthea, his wife, who is moved by gratitude when Cyrus saves her from this, the so-called traitor, Araspus. She believes she and her husband have incurred a debt of gratitude that the couple's perfect devotion to Cyrus alone will repay. Her husband is moved, in turn, by his love of her. Abradatus owes very little to Cyrus for protecting his marriage, for Cyrus had no objection to Araspus persuading Panthea to sleep with him. He sent someone to check him only when he was informed by Panthea's messenger that he threatened violence. Cyrus is less concerned with protecting Panthea than in making use of Araspus's remorse. Araspus admires Cyrus's virtue and serves him willingly. He allows himself to appear a traitor when he runs off to the Assyrians. But just as Cyrus knows both the gods and his subjects' devotion to them can be quite useful, similarly, Abradatus' devotion to Panthea, whose name, of course, means all gods, um, is, a, is a boon. Panthea turns her husband's devotion to her over to Cyrus and sacrifices him to her supposed protector. Cyrus is happy to accept the devotion of the loving couple and sends Abradatus, Panthea's jewel, she calls him, 
into the front of the fray in accord with his request. He is brutally slaughtered. When Panthea sees what remains of her jewel, she blames herself. And when Cyrus sees her mourning over the scattered remnants of her husband's body, which she carefully arranges as in life, he is moved by her plight and even more by her remorseful suicide. Cyrus was able to exploit the erotic and romantic love between Abradatus and Panthea, and for her, there is no hope of happiness after Abradatus' death. The two provide a sharp contrast with Croesus, who alone points to the possibility of Eros as an alternative to the satisfaction of ruling, whether it is his attachment to the wife whom he loves or to love of the truth. Part three, happiness, nobility, and justice, Cyrus's ends. So this is more from Cyrus's own point of view. Cyrus is not interested in pursuing glory alone. He makes clear in a later conversation with Croesus how he understands happiness, quote, he who is able to acquire the most while keeping to what is just and to use the most while keeping to what is noble, him do I believe to be the happiest, end quote. What does it mean to keep to what is just and noble? Cyrus certainly wants, wishes to be known as the benefactor of those he governs. Among his good deeds are his just dealings with his subordinates. Xenophon reports that after conquering Sardis and plundering its treasure, he distributed it to his subordinates according to their worth. Quote, thus all received their fair share, we read, end, end, end quote. Their worth in this case is closely correlated to their obedience to him. Disobedience is punished swiftly and harshly. When one of his subordinates, a man named Diaphernes, quote, thought that he would appear more free if he did not respond to Cyrus's call quickly, end quote, he was permanently dismissed. Cyrus does not distinguish between personal merit and usefulness to him in his enterprises, whatever they may be. Cyrus's grip on his subordinates and on all the people he conquers is tight. He seems always to perceive their be the behavior, even the motives of his subordinates. He avoids imposing suffering he considers unnecessary or likely to promote rebellion. He knows what will inspire them to the action he seeks. Cyrus's promise to his soldiers when he exhorts them to fight valiantly against Croesus's army clarifies their reasons for obeying. Cyrus lists the prizes for which they will be fighting. Quote, to pursue, to strike, to kill, to have good things, to hear noble things, to be free, to rule, end quote. He takes for granted that pursuing, striking, and killing are pleasurable. Whether the soldiers in fact have the opportunity to enjoy freedom and the ability to rule is unclear. Is it enough for them that they follow a man who is free to act as he pleases and to rule over vast domains? At least the virtues Cyrus demands from others are the ones he practices. He offers himself, Xenophon says, as a pattern to them. And he endeavors to keep the best of his men together even once they have defeated all the cities of Asia. First, he encourages them to give gratitude to the gods, quote, because they granted that we obtain what we believe we deserved, end quote. The gods have power only to the extent that Cyrus's knowledge is incomplete or that his projects are subject to chance. He follows this with a speech defending their enslavement of many and their plunder of the goods of the conquered. He says, this is your, the fourth block quote, <clears throat> let no one of you believe that in having these things we have what belongs to others. It is an eternal law among all human beings that when a city is captured by those at war, both the bodies of those in the city and their valuables belong to those who take it. It will not be by injustice then that you will have whatever you may have, but it will be by benevolence that you refrain from taking something away if you allow them to have anything." End quote. 
Cyrus's reputation for justice can remain intact only if service to him is the very substance of justice. Xenophon depicts him as a commander who never errs, not even in his assessment of his desert. He looks up to no one and no thing that can judge his behavior because there is nothing superior to him, not even the gods. He understands he sacrifices before every battle, he does all those things, but he never once asks the gods to help him make a judgment. He always does that himself. He understands the necessities he cannot avoid well enough to exploit them. He holds himself to no other standard than what is effectual, and what is effectual, he claims, coincides with what is noble and good. If human beings can be ruled consistently, Xenophon seems to show that the ruler must be a man like Cyrus, one who is beholden to no superior authority and afflicted neither by passions nor by prejudices that limit his recognition of whatever he must confront. He knows how to identify those he can subdue with little effort as well as those he must fear. His friendship is the only friendship such men are free to cultivate. They must and presumably can find their good in his. When Chrysanthus, a Persian peer who has been with Cyrus from the beginning of his campaign to protect media, argues for willing obedience to Cyrus, he provides an explanation of how Cyrus's followers can respond to his exhortation and remain free. This is the fifth block quote. Then just as you yourselves think it right to rule over those beneath you, let us similarly obey those whom it is seemly to obey. We need to be different from slaves in this. Whereas slaves serve their masters involuntarily, if in fact we think it right to be free, we need to do voluntarily what appears to be most worthwhile. Even where a city is managed without monarchy, the one that is especially willing to obey its rulers is least compelled to submit to its enemies." End quote. Chrysanthus seems to refer here to a common good that he, like Cyrus, can recognize and pursue. Slaves, by contrast, are those who must be governed for their own good. Cyrus is vividly aware of Chrysanthus' loyalty to him and acknowledges it. He is rewarded by Cyrus with a place of honor and a kiss. Cyrus must explain to the rival Histaspes, another loyal follower who is envious of Chrysanthus' distinctions, quote, Chrysanthus here did not wait for our call. He instead reported before he was called. Secondly, he not only did what he was ordered, he also did what he himself knew would be better for us if it were done. In these matters, at least, what prevents him from being even better for me than I am myself, end quote. If Cyrus seems at first to refer to a common good, he ends by emphasizing his own good. Neither he nor Chrysanthus distinguishes between them. Later, when Cyrus has conquered Babylon itself, he sends out some of his closest followers as satraps. He advises them to rule just as he does in Babylon. It is Chrysanthus who ends up ruling Lydia instead of Croesus. There is little reason to believe that he rules with a view to the common good of the Lydians or to justice although he no doubt imitates Cyrus in refraining from afflicting his subjects with unnecessary suffering. Chrysanthus rules the Lydians in accord with Cyrus's methods after they have been emasculated and deprived not only of the ability to defend themselves, but of everything beautiful. Chrysanthus, unlike Croesus, can be trusted to keep them under Cyrus's command. If the satraps rule in such a way as to secure always what is good for Cyrus, even when they rule others, they do not seem free. And yet, if Cyrus's methods are in accord with the nature of humans and achieve their good, Chrysanthus may be correct. He is not behaving slavishly, but rather in accord with his education in the science of ruling that Cyrus alone fully knows. If Chrysanthus thinks precisely as Cyrus does because he shares in the knowledge Cyrus possesses, he would not be merely good for Cyrus, but also for himself and, for those who find him, and even for those who find themselves under his rule. Cyrus's approach to ruling, after all, arises not from greed or other vices, but from his insight into human motives and from his experience in ruling. If they have learned well, his satraps will reign successfully and the people will prosper. 
The satraps alone would be sharers in Cyrus's virtue, people who can learn what he has learned about how to rule human beings. These men could then be described equally well as free followers and willing subjects. They are few, simply because few men are capable of the virtues Cyrus has achieved. A science of rule over humans would seem to be the sort of knowledge that would be as well as provide a common good to which at least some human beings could share, in which at least some human beings could share. <clears throat> but once we have Croesus's example before us, it is impossible not to compare Cyrus's treatment of him with his treatment of his loyal followers. Cyrus takes pains to convince Croesus of his superior judgment. He shows respect for him as an independent judge of matters that pertain to ruling. This differs radically from his treatment of Chrysanthus. Does Chrysanthus, unlike Croesus, lack the ability to judge? If he lacks it, does he lack it by nature, or has his subordination to Cyrus hindered his development of the ability to think for himself? Or is it simply that personal loyalty is a more reliable motive than common understanding? Cyrus respects Croesus, whose loyalty is uncertain. With him, Cyrus is on his guard, even while he tries to convince Croesus that his ways are best. In a way like the Armenian king, Croesus has apparently learned moderation, but greed seems to characterize humans in general. Cyrus is no exception. He acknowledges that, like others, he is insatiable for money. He has found that the best means of acquiring abundant wealth is to provide opportunities for prosperity among a vast array of subjects who look upon him kindly and to call upon them to offer it voluntarily when he needs cash. He demonstrates to Croesus that he acquires vast riches by acquiring willing subjects. In fact, he acquires much more that way than he could by amassing wealth directly and storing it away, Croesus agrees. He probably thinks of Croesus's cleverness, cleverness and his possible usefulness as a kind of wealth. Some of Cyrus's subjects surely serve him more willingly than do Croesus and his former subjects, the Lydians who give him all their beautiful things only to avoid being violently plundered, a voluntary action, strictly speaking, but only in a limited sense. Croesus even promises for the Lydians that they will offer him similar gifts in a year if he doesn't allow his soldiers to destroy the arts by thoroughly impoverishing the people. Cyrus's confidence that people give him their wealth voluntarily stems from the alacrity with which they give up their possessions to him and it is natural to wonder whether he knows them or himself as well as Croesus does, or as well as Croesus has learned to know himself. Cyrus's happiness lies not in the possession of knowledge, but in putting it into practice. This practice includes and requires the defeat of all rivals, anyone who could challenge him. Cyrus's understanding of how to rule humans is knowledge of how to make them obey, and this knowledge makes him the one worthy to rule. In defeating potential rivals, Cyrus also defeats external standards of distinction, honor, justice, piety, and love, even friendship. Many humans are easy to render slavish. Anyone with enough virtue to resist him, he must win over. With respect to the strongest among the Babylonians, Xenophon says, and this is the final block quote, he perceived many of them having the high thought that they were competent to rule. Considering then how they too might pose no risk to him, he resolved not to take their weapons and make them unwarlike, both holding it to be unjust and believing this to be the dis dissolution of his rule. Next, as for not letting them come close and being openly distrustful, he held this to be the beginning of war. Instead of all these policies, he judged one to be both best for his own safety and most noble, if he should be able to make the strongest become more friendly to himself than to each other." End quote. He succeeds. Those who seek Cyrus's friendship, quote, wished one another out of the way rather than do anything for their mutual good, end quote. Not only is it true that Cyrus respects no higher standard as the guide for his political and military actions, for Cyrus, there is no universal recognizable, universally recognizable standard of any sort. Justice is in the order Cyrus imposes on nations when he makes the laws. 
As in Plato's Republic, it is necessary to look at justice writ large, that is, displayed in a well-ordered city, to recognize it and its effects. So in the Cyropedia, the regime Cyrus establishes is the image that illustrates the knowledge that enables him to rule. It is presumably fitting that he rules because he is singularly capable of doing so. If his rule is just, must it also provide a model of the proper ordering of the human soul? Cyrus does seem to reorder the souls of his subjects to make them submit to him. The Lydians, for example, become much less warlike under his rule. Those who resist manifest the characteristic recalcitrance of humans who often mistake the pursuit of their selfish ends and the expression of envy for the pursuit of virtue. If Cyrus manages to make both the nations and the individuals who submit to him well-ordered, he has achieved what the city in speech could not. But there is no philosopher king in Cyrus's regime and no place for philosophical reflection. Unlike in Socrates' city in speech, the philosophical and practical ways of life are firmly separated. In the Cyropedia, Cyrus Xenophon does not directly address the proper ordering of the human soul. But this inference at least seems fitting. If Croesus must submit to an authority he hates, his soul must be disordered. He is at odds with himself. The order of Cyrus's and Croesus's souls differ radically. Cyrus's soul is not in conflict. He is a well-ordered but anomalous, I might say even monstrous, human being. While he rules, Cyrus's happiness is consistent with the thriving of many. The defeated who willingly fight for Cyrus can continue to fight and win rewards. Cyrus takes weapons only from those he believes he must enslave. Others he allows to keep their arms both considering it unjust to disarm them and knowing that it would lead to the dissolution of his empire. Cyrus rules in such a way as to give those with ambition and virtue room to acquire the things they seek. Most who live under Cyrus's rule can continue to seek wealth and distinction as they would have before and probably more successfully. The few who are like Croesus must redirect their ambition. But Cyrus undermines envy, not only by recognizing, but by promoting greed. And he may see only envy where there is real aspiration for virtue. Cyrus's success in ruling requires the suppression of such aspiration whenever it conflicts with his plans. His happiness is consistent with the happiness of many, but it is at odds with the happiness of the best of his subjects, at least if their happiness requires the pursuit of the highest aspirations of their souls. Part four, conclusion. This is shorter. Eros and the science of ruling. Cyrus appears to be totally unerotic, but he knows something of the power of Eros and he fears it. He therefore avoids the woman who has been set apart as his prize, the beautiful Panthea. When he finally sees her, she is mourning her husband's death and planning her suicide. Cyrus is moved to tears. Perhaps he too could have succumbed like Araspis to her attractions if he had allowed himself to gaze upon her beauty earlier. But when he had the chance, Cyrus rejected her beauty as nothing but a potential distraction from the work he had set for himself. Beauty is a powerful contender for rule. As Arbordatus demonstrates, it compels one to submit to being ruled by what one loves. In the context of this book, he seems rather a fool. And yet, Xenophon makes the story of his and his wife's love for one another too moving if he means only to illustrate Cyrus's superiority. Erotic attraction to beauty is a formal, formidable rival to Cyrus for dominance over the human soul, one that is not easily conquered once confronted. For Cyrus, Eros must be dealt with by evasion and fraud. The military virtues for him are the human virtues. The community of men in his army is the model for human community. Cyrus demands of those close to him that they endorse his elevation of honor over beauty, of Tumos over Eros, even if they can't help but leave some room for Eros in their lives. 
in their most ordinary and somewhat debased forms, both sexual eros and even a certain sort of pursuit of truth must be comprehended upon, under Cyrus's rule, and Cyrus welcomes them among his subjects in those forms. Marriages and families help maintain order, and as Croesus points out, the practice of the arts promotes prosperity and furnishes goods that satisfy inevitable greed. But in Cyrus's regime, there is no room for devotion to a good one deems higher than the political good, and certainly none for philosophy as an inquiry that may challenge Cyrus's norms. There are clear indications that there is no place for philosophy in Cyrus's regime. Tigranes, Socratic teacher, is dead. Cyrus calls his execution by Tigranes father a natural human error, and Cyrus replaces that teacher as Tigranes guide. Has Cyrus earned his rightful place as a guide for even the best of men, or has he usurped that place? Only if Cyrus truly knows the human soul and his political authority is based on a definitive understanding is his role as Tigranes' guide fitting and his rule just. Then, too, Croesus would have good reason to submit to Cyrus as unequivocally his superior in virtue. But in Cyrus's hands, at least, knowledge is a means to an end. In the hands of others, it is a potential threat. Cyrus rules humans much as herdsmen rule over animals. His insistence that the good for humans involve no aspiration beyond political ends is a degradation of the human being. The Persians Cyrus leaves behind when he dies become cowardly, slavish, and corrupt. Admiration for him and his accomplishment might have taken hold of the hearts of those who came after if his story were more beautiful. But Cyrus seems unlovable, and he does not love. As an adolescent, he could hardly avert his gaze from the dead Assyrians killed in the, in, in the first battle he ever fought. But nowhere else is he so moved. That Cyrus's behavior in that battle was one of the reasons that um, Astyages thought it was time to send him home. Cyrus does not love his subjects, and he is only partially successful in making them love him. His knowledge of humans must be distorted and incomplete if his practice of ruling them demands that their eros, as well as his, be stunted and denied. Cyrus's attempt to reconcile the just and the fitting mean he alone rules be because he is the most fit to do so. His laws become the standard of justice and the model for how to rule. Everyone who resists is reduced to slavery, the intended fate of any who aspire to an end they deem higher than the political. This is the source of hostility Cyrus cannot educate away. Cyrus's regime succeeds as long as it does precisely because it simplifies the endeavors of his subjects. The limitations to his authority arises because he cannot control the unruly erotic longings of all men and women. For it is characteristic of at least some humans to consider that acquisition of wealth and honor are not the only or the best sources of happiness and that the human things are not all that is worthy of our attention. The tendency to seek something beyond, beyond one that would be intrinsically satisfying is not easily uprooted from the human soul. But such thoughts are at odds with any political regime. In that respect, Cyrus's regime is not unique. Neither it nor any other regime could become eternal unless the souls of subjects could be permanently altered to suit the regime. This is no reductio ad absurdum, but a real, if frightening, possibility. Like ruling, the active pursuit of higher, more beautiful ends, or of the good simply, requires practical virtue. It is not only the Armenian king who lacks practical virtue, who lacks, uh, who lacks these virtues. Their practice is rare. The life of Cyrus shows him to be exemplary. He is both courageous and prudent. Perhaps only Socrates and the teacher of Tigranes, who was executed by the Armenian king, are capable of combining both intellectual and practical virtues with the highest aspirations in a single human soul. Xenophon's Socratic writings provide ample evidence of his admiration for the Socratic way of life. Xenophon was an admirer of Cyrus's knowledge and skill in ruling, but for him, unlike for Tigranes, Cyrus was no substitute for Socrates. 
his teacher and the model for, of what is truly noble and good. The combination of nobility and justice is a theme of the education of and by Cyrus. But in the memorabilia, Xenophon ascribes to Socrates knowledge of nobility and goodness. Cyrus's rule illustrates the knowledge of how to rule human beings. But politics is not the highest human endeavor. Xenophon's study of politics points to a study of the souls the political horizon cannot comprehend. Thank you.